To start off our afternoon, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. David Martz, who also graciously, I'm not supposed to turn my head, also graciously moderated our morning question and answer session. Uh, Dr. Martz's expertise and enthusiasm have been an incredible, incredible support in planning for this event today. Um, it, it's, it's been my pleasure to work with him and learn from him. Um, Dr. Martz is a board certified physician who practiced internal medicine, hematology, oncology for 30 years. He trained in internal medicine and hematology at Washington University and Stanford University after getting his MD at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center in 1965. As a Coloradan, his Lyme disease experience was quite limited until April 2003 when he acquired ALS motor neuron disease, which was accompanied by Lyme-like systemic symptoms. His subsequent diagnosis, treatment, and remarkable response is detailed in a 2006 Acta Neurologica Scandinavia publication. Wow, I got that out. Uh, he devoted the next two and a half years to clinical study and outcome monitoring of extended antibiotic treatment for ALS motor neuron disease, as well as chronic Lyme patients, with an excellent response and minimal side effects. He is now retired and lives with his wife in Colorado Springs, and we are just so grateful to have him here with us today. Uh, please welcome Dr. Mart, or, yeah, Dr. David Mart. Thank you, Monica. What a, what a privilege it has been to see all the work behind the scenes that has gone into preparing for today's workshop. It really have my hats off to Monica and Nancy and all, all those who behind the scenes have helped to bring this out. Hopefully this is just the first of workshops that will be yet to come. Presentations this morning by Pat Smith and Dr. Cameron are tough to follow. They did wonderful job of laying the foundation about the basic concepts of Lyme disease. I've been given the opportunity to build on that foundation by discussing how that might be affecting us as Coloradans. With the training I had at really good universities for my postgraduate training in internal medicine, I was a reasonably good doctor when I started in 1970. And for the first 10 years or so in practice, I was pretty much, when there were difficult diagnoses, one of the go-to doctors to figure out what was going on. Didn't always figure it out. But I loved the diagnostic challenges and the opportunity to get my teeth into a difficult, a difficult case. They hadn't even discovered Lyme disease when I finished my training in 1970. And I only heard about it here and there in the years that was after that. So I had no knowledge about the disease until it came to roost in my own house. That's what has prompted me to be able to share with you today some of our own personal encounter with Lyme disease and then how that affected us in trying to help other people with the related situation. For me, it's by no means a rhetorical comment to say I'm so glad to be here with you today. You might see I did not make a typographical error in making that slide. I am so glad. <laughs> and that's because 13 years ago this week, May 2003, my wife and I were told by an academic neurologist from the University of Minnesota, Dan, who specialized in ALS, that I had ALS. Now, many of you may know <clears throat> that's a death sentence. No one has ever survived accurately diagnosed ALS. D and I appreciated his honesty. As you may know, this is a disease that over the course of, oh, usually two to five years, every single muscle in the body becomes useless so that in the end, someone with ALS can only roll their eyes. The only muscles that work are the muscles that control their eyeball. 
They can't wiggle their fingers, they can't wiggle their toes, they can't roll over. And in the end, they can't talk, they can't swallow, and without a ventilator, they can't breathe. Part of the horror of this tragic illness is that usually the brain is spared and is not affected. So you end up with a trapped brain, trapped in a body where the brain can think, but you can't even talk to express yourself. And you're in a useless body. Dr. Smith said my prognosis was probably in the range of two and a half years. And that's sort of in the average, or maybe a little earlier. Uh, the range, I mean, the duration of ALS is pretty much less than five years. And somewhere around three years is pretty much the average. So when I say I'm glad to be here today, it's because had things not changed, I would have been dead in 2005 or 2006. D said, Dave, what are the things that are important to you? And so we talked about the importance of building relationships, redoing some some of the things that get lost in the life of a busy doctor. And in terms of things to do, I said, I'd love to have one more of my occasional fishing trips to Canada, which we did. Now this picture actually is taken from a more recent trip, but it's symbolic of the fact that we made sure I could do that while I still could. This was in a time before the term uh, bucket list had been coined, but it was our spontaneous version of the bucket list. D and I had also traveled occasionally. We're not big world set jetters, but we'd always wanted to go to Africa and do a photo safari. And while I could still ambulate, we were able to arrange a trip to do a photo safari in Africa. By six months from the diagnosis, my muscles were beginning to shrink. I'd lost 15 pounds of muscle weight. A guy who previously was just a recreational level skier and scuba diver could stand for about five minutes and could walk about 100 feet. I needed assistance to dress, to roll over. I couldn't get up from a chair, so I would clasp my hands like this and my 110-pound wife would leverage this 250-pound guy up out of the chair so I could stand and take a few steps. The other option was to buy what I called an ejector chair, <laughs> those recliners that have electric power and will stand you up so you're vertical and can step out of them. Dr. Smith said, Dave, you can be in a wheelchair in just a few months and you're probably going to die in a couple of years. I was so grateful for that. So many neurologists duck those kind of questions. D and I asked him specifically to tell us what he thought so we could plan appropriately. So we prepared for an uncertain future. On the other hand, I recognized that there were symptoms in my illness that didn't fit with ALS. I had been the AARP Energizer Bunny, where 14 hours a day was pretty much the rule. I was so exhausted when this first came on that if people came over to share time with us, have a cup of coffee, share their concerns, pray with us, 20, 30 minutes, I turn ashen and have to go lie down. I developed arthritis, which I'd never had before, which I hadn't ever had before. My shoulders and uh, elbows and hands and wrists, it was a lot like rheumatoid arthritis, except in addition, in my both shoulders, I got inflammatory capsulitis, which means my shoulder joints froze. And they had to take a needle and put cortisone actually into the joint to decrease the inflammation enough that the physical therapist could get my arms moving again. And all my muscles ached and hurt and D would come and man, it was a great reason to get a thousand back rubs a week. <laughs> it was so achy. 
And in addition to that kind of muscle pain, my whole body hurt. It, I'm a guy who, up to that time, would take the occasional aspirin or Tylenol or ibuprofen, you know, a few times a year. I hurt so bad, I was on Oxycontin, Oxycodone twice a day in large doses just to get through the pain of the illness. That old Dick Tracy, Sherlock Holmes, analytical diagnostic brain wasn't dead yet. And I kept saying to myself, these symptoms sound sort of like Lyme disease. Is it possible that Lyme disease is what's going on? Well, I had a team of wonderful doctors in Colorado Springs, and they were kind enough to let me intrude into my own care a little bit and make suggestions. And so I said, come on, let's test for Lyme. OK, sent the blood test off to, Lyme, to Mayo Clinic, the ELISA test. Negative. A month later, I wasn't going to give up. Let's try it again. Maybe just turn positive now. We did that three times. Always negative. I said, well, let's go to a really famous lab. So like, we sent the sample off to Stony Brook in New York, one of the most famous Lyme aware laboratories in the country. Came back negative. That was the Western blot. It was eight months into my illness when a California laboratory found the DNA of the Borrelia bacteria, the Lyme Borrelia bacteria, in my system. By a PCR DNA test, I had Borrelia in my body. Well, that meant I had to have an active Lyme infection. It didn't mean it had anything to do with my ALS. It could be totally coincidental. Even if it was not coincidental, it didn't mean that treating it would make any difference in my ALS, which was progressing fairly rapidly in the standard way. We saw a Lyme specialist in Texas, and he said basically those things, but he'd be willing to treat me if he, we understood that there were no promises. And D and I said, well, what do we got to lose? Why not give it a try? He put me on four antibiotics at the same time, Rocephin, intravenously, Zithromax orally, Mepron, which is actually an anti-Babesia um, medication, and Flagyl, all four at the same time. It was nothing short of miraculous. In a month, the pain was gone. I never took another Oxycontin. The arthritis was gone. I never took another injection of methotrexate. My endurance had increased from less than an hour to three or four hours. At two months, I could cross my legs for the first time in a year. At three months, I could arise alone from a chair for the first time in over a year. By six months, I was pretty well back to about 70% of my, base, my baseline strength. And by a year, I was pretty much as you see me now. You would not guess from just seeing me that I'd ever had a serious illness. And for 75, I pretty well passed most values. Now, I've not returned to normal. The damage that the ALS had done in destroying certain muscles of the body did not repair. It was sort of like a forest fire. The trees that are burned don't blossom again. But we're put together so that the body can compensate. And it may be that some of the muscles that were in danger by the active Lyme infection with the treatment were able to turn down that, turn, turn the damage off and recover, much as we try to do, as you physicians will know, in heart attacks by getting blood back to the to the heart muscle as quickly as possible to allow more of the heart muscle to recover in the face of a heart attack. This was mentioned in passing a little bit ago but in the introduction. Dr. Harvey and I published this in Acta Neurologica Scandinavia in 2006. To our knowledge, it is the first reported case of someone with ALS absolutely and categorically proven by the best level of neurologists that stabilized and showed improvement with aggressive treatment for Lyme disease.
being a pay it forward kind of guy and so grateful for that unique opportunity, we decided to open a study clinic, a research clinic called, see it at the bottom there, Rocky Mountain Chronic Disease Specialists. We put together a clinic made up of myself and another physician friend who came out of retirement to join me. We planned for us to each work half time so we could work two and a half days a week and enjoy our retirement the rest of the week and we began to see patients. We did not advertise. They just began to come in. Three months into the practice, my colleague said, Dave, I, I really admire you for doing this, but my retirement is totally gone and I spent 50 years preparing for it and I, I just can't do this anymore. So with understanding, I replaced him with some other staff, but our purpose was to explore the concept of so-called chronic Lyme disease. Does it really exist? What are its clinical characteristics? What are the possible mechanisms that uh, cause people to get the symptoms they do? What treatment is useful and what is the response rate? We wanted to provide access for concerned patients and we wanted to do it in such a way of regularity and standardization that if we gave data that proved that it was or wasn't beneficial, that it would be of publicational quality. Again, as we said earlier this morning, thinking that if chronic Lyme disease is ever going to get on the scientifically accepted map, we got to play by the rules that is required for the rest of medical information. Well, in the course of two and a half years, we saw about 900 patients. Of those, about 130 had neurological disease, of which about 90 had ALS-like motor neuron disease, about 25 had MS-like neurological disease, and about 15 had Parkinson-like disease. In addition, and maybe by coincidence or not, Many of them had Lyme-like symptoms, as did I, with fatigue and or the rheumatoid muscular joint symptoms, cognitive dysfunction, neuropsychiatric issues, or pain. Now, I have selected out of those 900 patients to talk to you specifically about today, two subgroups. The first subgroup that we'll talk about is the 14 patients out of the 90 or so with ALS who showed stabilization and objective functional improvement with Lyme therapy, and we'll talk first about those. Of the Lyme-like symptoms, we set up our own sort of um, quality of life measurements so that we could follow them from office visit to office visit. And we asked them to quantitate their fatigue from zero to 10 on how bad it is. Likewise, for their musculoskeletal symptoms, their cognitive limitations, their um, neurological symptoms, their emotional status, and their pain issues. So every visit on every patient, we would get a circle around a three or a seven or a 10 for whatever that was. Now, subsequently, Mindy Gooden, a wonderful physician assistant who's a equivalent of an internal medicine physician herself who worked side by side with me for a year and a half, put to revise this even more so that each of the 10 categories had some specifics underneath it that would help the people to be more objective as they commented on the severity of those sometimes subjective symptoms. One of the problems we have in the chronic Lyme disease world is there is not a universally accepted definitive definition of it by those of us in the field. Everyone, Dr. Cameron, myself, Dr. Schrader, you know, Dr. Um, Horowitz, everyone has their own sort of set of symptoms and they have a lot of parallels, but there's not a unified. So we sort of put together our own RMCDS, Rocky Mountain Crying Disease Specialist definition.
of these five issues. Number one, having profound fatigue that is not relieved by resting. Number two, having the joint and muscle features that we would call rheumatoid. Number three, a word I just made up called discognition, but the problem with brain function in terms of speed of processing and memory and those kind, brain fog, those kinds of things. Um, number four, mood disorder, particularly anxiety or depression, um, and then the intractable pain. Now these, in order to qualify for the diagnosis, they had, what am I doing? They had, they, they had to need chronic medication to control it, or it needed to cause significant functional disability. Sorry. We devised this picture to sort of illustrate it as though chronic Lyme disease stands on five pillars. And if you have four, of the, four or five of those pillars uh, to a high degree, then you're very likely to have Lyme disease. If you had three, you probably had it. If you had two, you possibly had it. If you had only one, who knows? That's just our own personal way of working with it until something better comes along. With our 14 treatment responsive ALS patients, we monitored those Lyme-like symptoms from visit to visit, and we also monitored their neurological response in two different ways, the practical observ observable function. You know, um, you have, are you up to, able to be up and around more than you could? Can you walk farther than you could? And then there is a standardized ALS function score that is used throughout academic medicine, and we kept track of that. 48 is a 100% functional person, and zero is zero function in three or four different categories of using your arms, using your legs, using your speech, and so forth. So we kept those scores on everybody. Now I made a few graphs to show you in these 14 responsive patients, the level of fatigue that they reported and how much it changed with antibiotic therapy. So for each of these 14 patients, the red bar is how bad their fatigue was felt to be before treatment and the green bar after receiving antibiotic treatment. Impressive, huh? We did the same thing with their rheumatoid symptoms. Again, all showed improvement. We did it again with their cognitive dysfunction, and all but about three uh, had significant cognitive dysfunction and showed significant improvement. Uh, the neurological part, of course, speaks for itself. That was what this was all about. And even some of them had emotional issues of anxiety or depression or that sort of thing. And look, every one of them showed improvement at that component. Now, this had nothing to do with ALS. These are Lyme-like symptoms in ALS patients. Same is true of the pain, such as I had needing OxyContin. We asked them for them to rate how they felt overall before and after the treat antibiotic treatment. So the green is how they felt after treatment. And look how those numbers shot up in terms of their sense of well-being with antibiotic therapy. Now we kept the pretty careful statistics on the laboratory that we ran and the common laboratory test that you would get when you would go to a good internal medicine or family doctor, like the blood count, the SED rate, inflammatory measurement CRP, the lupus test B12, the heavy metal levels, they were mostly normal. Hardly any of them were abnormal in any of these 14 patients. And that's what your doctors find in you if you go to them with Lyme-like illness, regardless of the ALS or not component. We're also intrigued by the possibility that so-called cytokines might be elevated in this illness. And cytokines are inflammatory chemicals generated by the immune system in response to infections usually. And it's a healthy part of what we're made to do under the stress of an infection so that names don't need to pay any attention to, but one of them is IL-6. Another common one in the medical field is TNF-alpha. And these are chemicals that are elevated acutely when somebody gets an infection that help put the fire out. But we find that in the chronic disease, 
instead of being elevated a little bit and going away, they get exaggeratedly elevated and stay there. And one of the theories, one which I certainly hold, is that the symptoms of Lyme disease are due to exaggerated quantities of the cytokine kinds, which at high level attack the body rather than getting rid of the problem. And I would tell my patients to try and explain this medical concept, maybe it's sort of like fire. A little bit of fire is great. You can roast hot dogs over it. Fire out of control burns down forests and apartment buildings. And chronic smoldering Lyme disease would be parallel to the latter situation. Oh, I forgot to mention, of those 14 patients, four of them had elevated IL-6, six of them had elevated TNF-alpha, and you see those other tests were also abnormal without going into the specifics of them. We also tested for Lyme disease, and we used the conventional ELISA basic screening test, and all 14 who responded were negative ELISA, as was I, three times at Mayo Clinic and once at Stony Brook. We did the more advanced screening called the Western blot, and all 14 who responded had a negative Western blot. We sent the Western blot to the special, California, special lab in California that had found my Lyme DNA, and using their criteria, half of them tested positive for Lyme disease, but the other half didn't. Our treatment was similar to the drugs that had been used on myself, ceftriaxone, uh, zithromycin, metronidazole, and leprium, <laughs> larium, or mepron. Those are just the generic names for the drugs I had on the earlier slide. What happened? Believe it or not, nine of the 14 responsive patients were significantly improved, and five were definitely and somewhat improved, so that makes the 14. Now we had the sense, but didn't quantitate it or follow it so we could prove it, that another portion of our practice of the 90 patients seemed to stabilize the ALS off and not get worse. And we kind of decided that the goal in treating ALS for Lyme disease is to stop the progression. So. You don't go ahead and get on a ventilator and die in another two years. You at least stabilize off at where you are. And then if you have the good fortune to show some functional improvement, that's another added benefit. Well, let me give you some examples of the responses we saw in about five of those 14. One of the persons whose name was mentioned earlier in that person's work with ILADS, whom I will not mention by name, who saw me presented with foot drop. Couldn't, couldn't make her toe come up. And she could only walk about a block. With treatment, the foot drop totally resolved, and she could walk two miles. That's not trivial improvement, being able to move five fingers instead of four. Another of the patients who came in wheelchair bound was able to get up out of the wheelchair with help and to walk 200 steps. Much better function than he had previously. Another wheelchair-bound lady, we had to lift her, and she's a big woman, up onto the exam table at her first visit. She became capable of living alone with independent ambulation. I still get kind of goosebumps about that. One of our patients who could only walk 10 feet he became able to walk 100 yards. Now, all of these were accompanied by a significant rise in their ALS FRS score that I mentioned earlier. But because this is a lay audience, I didn't put that slide on to tell you, but some made dramatic increases. One person went from 25 to 39, 48 being near normal function. Most remarkable patient we met when he was on a ventilator with aspiration pneumonia and had characteristic and with ALS. And he wanted to be tried for treatment and with the antibiotic treatment, he got off the ventilator, the tracheotomy was closed, his feeding tube was taken out, and he was capable of living alone and being self-sufficient. And I want to mention that these weren't temporary responses. 
everyone maintained those responses. Well, doing something like that with four intense drugs, you're bound to have all sorts of difficult complications, huh? Well, of these 14, antibiotic diarrhea with the bacteria called C. difficile, zero of the 14, and out of our 900 patients, maybe five or six did, it was pretty easy to treat. Blood infections, so-called bacteremia or sepsis, you know, these people have long-time intravenous antibiotics going through like a chemotherapy catheter. There were zero in the 14, and out of our 900 patients, well, maybe seven, but we had trained them that if they got shaking chills, to call immediately, get to the emergency room, get blood cultures drawn, get the tube pulled out, get on antibiotics, and they all had it managed quite well because of good compliance with our recommendations. The catheter sometimes gets infected along the skin area and has to be pulled out. Among our 14 responders, none did. Among our 900 patients, maybe 15 or 20, but not a big number. There was no treatment death, and there was no serious long-term damage in treating a universally fatal disease. <clears throat> well, let's move now to another segment of our population. We saw about 800 patients, both from Colorado and many other states, and actually a few came from across the big pond. 130 or so, as I mentioned earlier, had various neurological manifestations in that left around 700, 750 with variants of chronic Lyme disease, such as many of you may have experienced. Fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, you know, those kind of things are a chronic condition that nobody could diagnose. Patients that see doctors like Dr. Cameron and myself have seen an average of 24, two dozen good physicians, including Mayo Clinic and other high quality doctors, and either have no diagnosis or they said, well, maybe you have MS, or maybe you have lupus, or maybe you have chronic fatigue, but no definitive diagnosis is established. That was our experience also. One of the key parts of this presentation is to let you know that when we looked at the zip codes of dwelling of residents among our almost 900 patients, somewhere in the 200 to 250 were Colorado zip codes. That's almost a fourth, around a fourth of the patients we saw were Colorado residents. Now I want to talk about a subgroup of 40 patients who lived in Yuma County, northeastern rural Colorado Springs. What happened was that there was a 16-year-old girl who had been the um, heir apparent to being the uh, top graduate in her class, the valedictorian, whose brain just turned to mush and she couldn't write her ABCs, more or less. Her body hurt all over. She was profoundly exhausted. She slept day and night. Her life just turned to, she was a slug. And this was a bright girl. She'd been athletically active and capable. And she had just, her life had turned to, to well, let's call it mud. She was, her parents were the kind of people who research the internet and gather information and they said, hey, maybe she has Lyme disease. I hear that there's a doctor in Colorado Springs that's working on that. Let's take her to see him. Well, we thought she had Lyme disease too. She was hard to treat because she'd been so sick so long. But she definitely improved so that she could go out on the cattle roundups again and drive the truck and, you know, showed several areas of functional improvement. Her grades got better. She could go back to school. And being a rural community, word spreads fast. And the rural grapevine, have you heard about so-and-so's daughters? You've seen this doctor in Colorado Springs and her symptoms sound a little bit like yours. Why don't you go see him too? Well, from that index case, we ended up seeing about 40, exactly 40 patients from that county. So we are presenting here some information about that group. Now this is a, similar to the maps you have seen earlier. This one is a few years old, but showing the incidence of Lyme disease across the United States. And on this particular map, there is no dot in the state of Colorado. As you know, there are now, what, a total of 13 cases that have been reported as having 
had Lyme disease. I spent the last two years of high school down near La Junta on the eastern slope of Colorado. And in my years of practice, I had a warm place in my heart for what we call eastern slopers. They are a pretty similar group of rural farming type people. They're like fifth generation residents that began um, way, way, way back when. Um, they're agrarian, no-nonsense lifestyle people. They work hard even though the results are uncertain. They may have a wonderful crop of wheat coming for this season and then the hail comes and wipes it out. And, well, it happens. We'll see what happens next year. Love those kind of people. They observe accurately. They make good conclusions. They remember what they've seen. They're clearly survivors. They're honest. They're dependable. I think they make ideal neighbors, ideal friends, ideal colleagues, and ideal patients. Well, these are the characteristics of people we saw from Yuma County. First, I'll show you the demographics, then their symptoms, their lab results, the treatment, and the response. The age ranged from 17 to 85 with a median of 52. There were almost 23 women and 17 men. Almost half of them had other family members with Lyme-like chronic illnesses. Eight of them remembered a Colorado tick bite. The other two either didn't or were uncertain. My neighbor brought this picture down, with two doors down from me in Colorado Springs. He had taken it of his, one of his relatives in his house and said, Dave, does that look like Lyme disease to you? I don't know. It's not a very good picture, but I think it looks an awful lot like a target skin rash. Dan, would you, would you say it might fit that? It's kind of blurry. It's hard to be sure. No, it's red, yeah. Anyway, of our 40 patients, here's how many of them had significant fatigue. How many of them had significant rheumatoid symptoms? How many of them had cognitive dysfunction? How many of them had neurological symptoms, emotional symptoms, significant pain? Now remember this farming community. So there could be a good deal of pain ascribed to their lifestyle, but this is pain they thought was not consistent with what they did vocationally. We ran a huge battery of tests on virtually every patient to keep it standardized and to cover as many alternative considerations of diagnosis as we could. And for the most part, these were all negative. I mentioned the cytokine markers, which is where it says inflammatory markers there. But we kept this kind of laboratory data on virtually everyone. In the Lyme testing on these 40 patients from Yuma, once again, the ELISA screening test was negative in all of them. The Western blot or more sophisticated test, only eight of them met the, met the CDC criteria for positive Lyme serology, 32 didn't. Using the California lab criteria was almost 50-50. So once again, even with the best tests we know at the present time, of these people with Lyme-like symptoms, 50% of them didn't have it. This is a graph to show the similar thing. Once again, here's the measurement of the inflammatory cytokines, and 75% of them had elevation in the TNF-alpha. 40% um, of them had circulating immune complexes, which is kind of a sophisticated comment. Uh, but they all had kind of the indirect evidence of chronic inflammatory disease. Here's a graph showing one of the cytokines. Look, the yellow bars are ones that had elevated TNF-alpha. I mean, it's there. So our protocol was similar to what I've described. Most of them were treated orally, and we would give them a group of three or four antibiotics. We'd layer them on top of each other, so start this one, then add this one, then add this one, and we'd adjust them, and we'd start at low dose, and then gradually add the next ones on. We only used IM or IV if they were sicker or it was predominantly neurological disease. Our criteria for how long to do it was that they had been three months past what they considered to be well. And that resulted in patients being treated somewhere from six months to over two years. The response was it was beneficial, 
and the complications, like the previous group, were minimal. Now here's the antibiotics once again, used Zithro and Flagyl and Amoxicillin and INH. And then only a few got Rocephin or Sextrione. Out of the 14, 13 said they were much better. 22 said they were definitely better. Four said they weren't sure there was any change and one thought they might be a little bit worse. So in summary, 40 self-referred second to fourth generation Colorado agrarians were seen who were credible observers. There were no whiners in the group. They had typical chronic Lyme-like diseases, illnesses. 20% were bitten by ticks from Colorado and 50% had family history positive for chronic inflammatory diseases. All of them had basically a normal physical examination. That is one of the problems we have in making, making the diagnosis and getting other doctors to believe us. And you probably heard people with Lyme disease don't like, but you look so good because they feel so bad. We found rare co-infections in this group. The immune complex, I mean the uh, inflammatory chemicals were abnormal. We felt we had a fairly high response rate of 35 over 40, having significant improvement to the an extended antibiotic, and there were no complications. What are our conclusions? Well, we think Lyme-like illness clearly exists in Colorado. We think it's very possible, in fact likely, that Borrelia plays the role in it, but that's not proven by current IDSA criteria. It's possible that the same chronic inflammatory illness symptoms could be created by other infections than Borrelia or multiple infections. We found that the standard laboratory testing was almost always normal. We felt there was good evidence that the symptoms were mediated by inflammation response to the smoldering infection as demonstrated by the high cytokine levels. And we wondered about the possibility of human to human transmission. I agree with what was said this morning. Uh, it depends on which side of neutral you stand. I stand a little bit on the suspicious side of thinking, saying, I think we ought to consider that it's a possibility, but I don't think it's 100% pr um, proven. Our, we concluded that these symptoms are due to an exaggerated immune response to a smoldering infection. So, is tick-borne or Lyme-like disease active in northeastern Colorado? I think we have enough evidence to say at least probably. Is chronic Lyme-like illness affecting our Colorado population? I personally think almost certainly. So, is that the end of the story? Well, there's a couple of addendums. Actually, uh, Pat alluded to this earlier. In the same weekend, another speaker unknown to me, I think it was the veterinarian from Oklahoma University, presented data, now this was several years ago, on Lyme serology in dogs as a sentinel or predictor of human Lyme. And I, you know, it's obvious there's a lot of positive canine serology in the Northeast, Northeast and California and Minnesota. But look at Colorado. See? See if I can make the pointer work. See, that's Colorado. And if you look a little bit closer, look at how many <laughs> are in Yuma County. Well, that may just be coincidence. This is my way of saying what was said, I think, earlier by Dr. Cameron. As far as Lyme disease is concerned, I think we're sort of like the typical story of five blind men trying to describe an elephant from what part of the elephant that was close to them, whether it was the trunk or the tusk or the ear or the leg or the tail. I think that there's a component of infection. We need to work out what are the, is there, what is the organism or organisms? What's the role of inflammation? What's the component of cytokine inflammatory chemicals? Is there a vasculitis going on, meaning inflammation of the tiny blood vessels in the body like we see in lupus. Everybody in our field thinks there is some immunosuppression to a, a little, to a lot. 
what are the transmission mechanisms that came up in this morning's discussion. And as also came up this morning, is there a genetic predisposition to being affected by the illness? So I want to thank all of you for your willingness to come and listen to something that's sort of outside the box and continue to think about it. As this group of lions that we saw on our trip to Kenya, who sensed potential lunch on the horizon, <laughs> lets us keep our eyes, our ears, and especially our minds. <laughs>